Dr. Ryan Robinson, welcome to Plant Yourself. Well, thanks so much for having me. It's a pleasure. Yeah, I'm really excited to have this conversation because we're going to be talking about what I now think is probably the most important contributor to human health, um, which for people who, who know my history with nutrition might be surprised to realize that it's not strictly the food we eat, but breathing. Um, so I... Uh, I went up to see you. There's a video that I, I think I've, I've been going back and forth as to whether I will share it with the world because it has like these intimate pictures of my nose and throat <laughs> and everything. But I think what the hell. Um, I was so about you, to say that's completely up to you. Um, yeah. So um, the HIP, HIPAA does not exist anymore. You can you can I give you permission to talk about all of my <laughs> my <laughs> pathways. Right, thank you. And, um, so uh, but let's let's uh, introduce you and have you tell people like, why am I talking to you? about breathing when in fact you're a dentist sure sure so um yeah i'll give you like a little background i mean and i think um you said it perfectly i'm i'm uh I'm, I'm a dentist and as my friends and my family and a lot of my colleagues uh in the physician community around the world um they say you know you're just a dentist and i say i know but that gives me the most powerful sort of opportunity to understand um, the way that people breathe and to see signs and symptoms that I think are um, sort of early indicators that there could be a, a problem. So um, I'd love to like kind of get into more of, of that and how dentists are so, you know, uniquely uh, positioned and have a great platform to be able to kind of get involved in this um, area of medicine. But, you know, just to kind of give you a little introduction on myself. So um, I was born and raised in um, Wilmington, Delaware. Uh, the first state, and um, I grew up here, and I was uh, heavily involved in uh, sports as a as a youngster. Um, definitely developed quite a uh, a passion for um, learning at a at a at a young age. Uh, I knew I wanted to be a doctor of some sort. I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. Um, I was kind of got to the end of high school and. I uh, was trying to make some big decisions and just was trying to decide whether or not I wanted to be a physician or I wanted to be a dentist. And so I d did start doing some shadowing and things like that. And uh, the more I shadowed these local dentists, you know, the more I really got to love um, sort of the, the career that a, that a dentist could have. And, you know, not just the work that they could do with their hands and, and all that. I thought that was really interesting interesting and I thought that I would be good at it because I've always had good hand-eye coordination and you know uh, the ability to kind of uh, be a good mechanic on things um, but also I, I like their lifestyle to be honest with you I thought that you know what better way to make a good living and to provide for a family and to have you know free time and not deal with you know morbidity and mortality and things that physicians have to deal with so I decided to go the dental route and so did um, I did my undergraduate studies at University of Delaware um, as a biology major. And so I was a pre-dental student from sort of the beginning. And uh, yeah, I went to dental school at the University of Maryland Dental School, which is uh, number one dental school in, in all, of the, all of the country. So I'm very proud of that. I got a great foundation for my education of dentistry. Um, and I came out and I was ready to conquer the world as the greatest tooth mechanic in the world. I was looking forward to helping people smile. I was looking forward to drilling out and filling as many cavities as I possibly could. I was looking forward to making connections and, and all that thing and all that stuff. So, um, yeah, I started off as a, as just your typical dentist. And, um, I think the one thing that people would describe, uh, about me that know me is, you know, I always, I'm, I'm always hungry for more. I always have a, a passion for, you know, learning and I'm never settle, settled. And so I think it could be sort of my Achilles heel is that I'm never kind of content with, you know, what I have in front of me or what I've learned. I always sort of press the issue for more, but I think, um, you know, with that and with, you know, I think the other thing people would say about me is I, I've never really been one to kind of play within the, within the rule book. I've always been one to sort of you know, press the limits and, and, uh, and ask questions and, and ask why and ask why not. Um, and so that sort of led me into uh, where I'm at now, which I, I became a CE junkie. I was traveling around the world, learning all about um, the different sort of- um, that's, that's continuing education. Yeah, continuing education. I, I was traveling around the world, learning everything I could about dentistry, whether it was from the cosmetics to the surgery, root canals, um, 
you know, you name it, anything that was advanced out there, all the technology that was out there, lasers, um, 3D scanning, all that stuff. I was really into it, orthodontics. Um, and then I, I went away in 2015 and I did a breakaway session at one of these big kind of conferences. And I heard this dentist who was speaking about the airway and it blew my mind. And it was one of those things that just had stimulated me right from the start. I just had no idea that a dentist was kind of in this position to be able to look at things beyond the teeth and be able to help somebody with their overall health and not just, you know, sort of be that tooth mechanic that th mm -hmm. fixes the problems as it comes yeah. up. So, so that's kind of where I'm at with that. Yeah. So I hear something that, uh, that sort of on surface sounds like a, a contradiction, but I, I think there's a, there's a deeper truth to it, which is on the one hand, you want, an, I wouldn't say an easy career, but a career in which it's easier than having to be woken up at 3 a.m. to be on call, to do that, to, to sort of, you know, to, to say, okay, I want to work hard, but not that hard. And I'm really hungry for, for more, and I'm going to go all over the place developing and getting more credits. Is, is, was there sort of tension or contradiction in those two impulses, or did having the time and not, and not having to be, you know, over uh, extending yourself give you the opportunity for learning? Yeah, I think that's a great question, man. Um, and that's something that I kind of wrestled with uh, for a while with myself and, and actually with my wife as well. So, you know, starting off as a dentist, I was kind of newly married at the time. And um, I sort of had the ability to show up to work at eight o'clock and leave at five o'clock if I so uh, desired. But um, the business started to consume me and the education that I was getting started to consume me. And, you know, instead of spending 35 hours, um, you know, clinically with patients and then being able to check out and have time, you know, for other things, I became so sort of ingrained in the profession. I, I became so ingrained and so sort of um, dedicated and almost obsessed with getting more and more information. And, you know, at one point, I think the wife took me aside and she said, you know, I thought you were becoming a dentist. You could spend more time at home and spend more weekends away and, and um, you know, be ready for our family, which at the time we didn't have a family. And now I have two kids and, you know, that, uh, that sort of, um, that sort of lifestyle uh, has continued. And I think that's, that is a big challenge for my family and I is, you know, I, I did pick this career to have sort of the easy road. Um, and, I haven't, I haven't taken that path, although it was there for me. I have taken the path of sort of most resistance. I've taken the path of continuing to challenge myself and step um, out of the bounds that I was sort of educated in and, and the education that I was indoctrinated in in school. I feel like all that information that I got is like nothing that I practice. I joked to, I, I think when you were here at the center, I joked to you, I said, all of my education, the, the, the things that I, you know, use my brain for every single day, the things that I um, so, sort of you know, come to work each day and practice is nothing that I learned in, in dental school. Literally every single little tiny bits and pieces of my education that have come together to make me who I am as a clinician today and as an educator has come after dental school. And that's something that um, took a lot of time and effort. I mean, I became, you know, boarded, I became triple boarded with, you know, a number of different organizations, which took time and effort and energy and dedication and sacrifice. I mean, I was away from the family a lot at nighttime and studying and putting my head back in the book and, you know, going on trips and all that. So yeah, it has been a challenge. And I think it, I think you brought that up perfectly. It's very contradicting to what I thought my career would be as to where I'm at now. But I'll tell you what, it's, it's something that I would, I would, I'd never have made a different decision looking back now. I mean, it's something that I'm so sort of um, grateful that I've had the ability to do all these things and kind of be in the position that I'm at right now. So um, no, no regrets at all. No looking back. Gotcha. Well, so whoever said, you know, if you love what you do, you'll never work a day in your life, right? Like, exactly right. You certainly came in, like, when I met you, just like, full of energy, like you're a total evangelist for <laughs> this, this missing component of, of, of health. Um, in fact, what, one of the reasons I was so excited to have this conversation is, like, I'm, you know, I operate on the periphery of the world of lifestyle medicine, of the you know, ACLM. I know lots of folks. I got a referral to you from, uh, from Karen Smith, who works at the Progressive Health of Delaware, lifestyle medicine with David Donahue and Brian Robeson. And lifestyle medicine has these five pillars, and it's missing 
the most important one, which which is breath and breathing. So maybe let's 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 pull back from like your story and become an educator now. And can you tell us like, okay, Howard's talking about breathing. I have been breathing my whole life. I'm pretty sure I'm doing it right because I'm not dead. I'm, st I, you know, th this is my 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 listener, my audience is thinking, why are we talking about breathing when it's the the thing that I have done the longest? And like, why would I even worry about it? Yeah, another great great question. So, you know, what I would say is it's it's a couple different pieces. So. You know, number one, because breathing is so sort of innate to everybody, um, we've never really challenged it. We've never really looked at it as something that can be, you know, healthy versus not healthy. And so, you know, I, when, I, when I sit back and look at it now, I'm like, you know, if we see somebody walking and they're limping or we see somebody walking with who's pigeon-toed, right, we don't look at them and say, hey, they, they, they don't need help. We say, hey, they, they do need help. So if we see someone who's choking at nighttime, if we see someone who's breathing through their mouth, which I want to get more into that, but if we see someone who's breathing wrong, you know, it's now sort of my duty and sort of the duty of, you know, my colleagues who have kind of educated themselves on this to be able to identify that and sort of call that out as being sort of uh, improper and unhealthy and, and a potential root cause of a lot of the problems that we see, you know, in today's sort of, um, in today's society and into this epidemic of health, you know, the health crisis that we're, that we're currently facing. So, you know, you can compare it to anything, but if you see someone walking funny, you would say something, you would say, hey, that person needs help. But when you see some, someone breathing funny, you know, a lot of people just kind of, it, it goes unnoticed. And, you know, that's the platform here is we have to educate people on what is healthy breathing versus what, what's not healthy breathing. Because as many people will find out, breathing controls everything. Breathing controls, you know, after we put those good foods into our body, you know, breathing is what allows us to take advantage of those foods. When we go to sleep at nighttime, and, you know, it's not just about the quantity of sleep, it's about the quality of sleep. And the number one thing that can affect quality of sleep is the way that you breathe, right? And, you know, with all the different sort of um, imbalances in someone's health today, whether it be cardiovascular, endocrine, you know, GI, um, anything hormone related, even cognitive impairment like anxiety, depression, Alzheimer's disease. I mean, breathing is at the root cause of all that. And when we control our breathing, we control our central nervous system. When we control the way that our bodies sort of operate and the way that our bodies function. So, you know, breathing is one of these sort of innate things that we, we need to do our job as educators to be able to show people what is improper breathing and what is um, sort of the right way to do it. And so that's, that's kind of one of our main missions here. It's at the root of what we do is, you know, we restore someone's quality of life by helping them breathe better. I mean, it's as simple as that. So but it, like this doesn't make sense to me or it didn't and I'm pretending that it still doesn't. Yeah. Um, so, okay, I get that our diets suck because we have, you know, hunter-gatherer genes in which we, we, we evolved in a, you know, an environment in which there wasn't Snickers bars at the checkout counter at Home Depot, where there wasn't such a thing as sodas. And so now we have our old genes and these new foods that are, you know, so we have to be thoughtful about our, our eating. We didn't have electric lights. Now we do. We didn't have alarm clocks. Now we do. So sleep can be disrupted. But it's the same air as it always was, more or less. I mean, it's not, sure. you know, like, sure, there's pollution in places, but it's still, you know, like 19% oxygen, 80% hydrogen, uh, nitrogen. Like, why are we all of a sudden such bad breathers? Yeah, fantastic. So um, I love talking about this topic because it is so sort of anthropologically studied and it's sort of misunderstood with a lot of people that just think it's as simple as, you know, someone can either do it or they can't. But actually, you know, what I'm here to tell you and what the research supports is, you know, overall as a society and humanity, you know, human beings, um, our skulls are growing smaller and smaller and smaller 
each year, which is contributing to more airway collapse, which is contributing to lower amounts of volume, which is contributing to us breathing through our mouths as a compensation, as a rescue type of breathing. Now, traditionally, 300 years ago, we go back to um, dig up human skulls. And, you know, my good friend and colleague, Dr. Mariana Evans, who was, you know, quoted and referenced in the book that you read and kind of what your, you know, enlightenment on breathing was with the James Nestor book, Breathe, you know, he quotes Dr. Mariana Evans as having the largest collection of skulls, you know, in the country. And so she does, she has these collection of skulls and it's really, really interesting. You go back 300 years ago and nobody had a crooked tooth in their whole entire in their whole entire body. In fact, anyone who had crooked teeth usually didn't make it. They usually didn't last to be an adult. They usually died, um, you know, before they were they before they were developed, um, and before they were able to, you know, reach their adult life. In, so, in other words, what almost everybody today has was three hundred years ago, essentially a fatal birth defect. Yeah, pretty much. And so it's almost like the de-evolution of the human skull. We are seeing this now through the studies that, you know, our faces are getting smaller, our teeth are getting more crooked, our 90% of our, of, of our kids' youth today have crooked teeth. 300 years ago, not one person had crooked teeth. It was very, very, very uncommon. And so as our skulls get smaller, this organ here that we have, which is our nose, which is extremely, extremely important for breathing, has become sort of um, it's become sort of uh, forgotten. And and uh, it, you know we've had we have like negligence to our nose, and so our noses are extremely, extremely a powerful organ. The nose allows us to warm filter and moisten all air as it comes in. Our noses contain what's called nitric oxide, this gas, this really important signaling gas molecule. It's located in our paranasal sinuses at like 200 times the amount anywhere else. And so nitric oxide is found all throughout sort of the vessels throughout our body and helps out with circulation. It helps out with blood pressure regulation. It helps out with um, hormone sort of balance. It helps out regulating our nervous system. It helps out, you know, being able to bring us into more of a parasympathetic state where we can rest and digest and less of a sympathetic state where we have fight or flight, or as we call it here, fright or flight. Um, you know, so the nose is really the, the most important organ that we've kind of like, we've lost good usage of it. And I think the James Nesser book brings great sort of attention to that with the study that he did on himself when he blocked his nose and automatically developed snoring, automatically developed uh, sleep apnea, and automatically his health went from being, you know, one of sort of your normal Western sort of health with uh, just a little bit of chronic disease to severe chronic disease, you know, within 10 days. And that's, really extremely neat. So yeah, we're living in this sort of uh, epidemic where, you know, breathing um, has become harder from a structural standpoint and, and from a functional standpoint. So, you know, here at our center, we do a really good job trying to understand yeah. the structure and the function and how both of those sort of tie together. Right. Okay. So I'm, I'm no evolutionary biologist, but I do know that 300 years is too short a time for evolution to make our skulls smaller, mm -hmm. um, what the heck happened? Yeah, I mean, so theoretically, the, the, um, what people have hypothesized and what the evidence sort of tells us is about 300 years ago during the Industrial Revolution, we started having things that were um, being able to be packaged, that were being able to be preserved. Our foods got a lot softer. Our foods became more sort of convenient. Our mothers uh, went back to the workplace, right? The moms had to stop breastfeeding as much. So, you know, the, the sort of development and the growth of the skull happens immediately when a baby is born. Immediately that baby learns how to latch on to the mother and be able to suck, swallow, and breathe with their nose and suck and swallow with their mouth. And so breastfeeding is one of those sort of um, things that I think now is becoming more popular. And um, we can talk about this in extension, but you know, I think now that we're breastfeeding is back, we're now finding tongue ties are, 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 are now more prevalent because mothers are having trouble with breastfeeding. But anyway, um, the skulls- What's, What are, what are tongue ties? So tongue ties are, are that little attachment below the tongue, which 
basically can be located in an unideal spot, maybe at the tip of the tongue, maybe you know halfway back to the tongue, or even posterior in the tongue, that um, that little band of tissue um, is really short or really tight. And so it prevents the tongue from being able to get up and sit on the roof of the mouth, which is the palate. So we have to look at the tongue, tongue as the, the, the body's natural expander. So when the tongue sits up on the roof of the mouth, the jaws actually will grow around it. So the tongue is the scaffold for the whole entire face and for the jaws to be able to develop properly. And so what we find now is that a lot of mothers that try and breastfeed because it's becoming more and more popular, a lot of mothers now will find that they have trouble with breastfeeding. They go have an evaluation by an international board certified lactation consultant. And now IBCLCs are sort of the front line to be able to identify a structural issue, issue such as a tongue tie. So what do the IBCLCs do? They identify this, they say, hey, we can work with you. We can try and get you to breastfeed better, but there's a structural issue here that you need to take care of. And so they would send them to a dentist who's, you know, advancedly trained in using um, good techniques and, and using sort of a team approach to being able to release a tongue, get that tongue up to the roof of the mouth and have that baby be able to suck, swallow and breathe again. And so... You know, it starts there, Howard. It's one of those things where if we don't sort of have the right mechanics that happen from the start, then we start feeding our kids these pouches, this soft food. We have less sort of use of our muscles of our face. We have less activation. We have less osteogenic potential of our jaws. Our jaws. What, is, what, is, what does that mean, osteogenic? So osteogenic is basically the, it's like from a cellular response of how well you're able to grow bone or not. So when our bones are stimulated, um, by muscles, our bones will grow bigger. So, and, and they'll grow in the right position, which is even more important. So we have these, a lot of these people that have more kind of narrow faces today that are a little bit more longer and narrow is, as, as opposed to like broad and forward. Um, and so when we you get the correct use of our tongue, we get the correct use of our muscles, when we chew on things that are supposed to be chewed upon, you know, we actually can stimulate growth of our jaws properly. And so, you know, it, it's very clear through the use of cone beam uh, technology nowadays and through 3D imaging that our kids and our, our adults, our faces are smaller and they're not growing to the potential that they could be. And then when we talk about the airway, which is behind the jaws, there's really only two bones. There's really only two structures that determine, you know, how big that airway is. And it's the cervical spine in the back in the posterior and it's the upper and lower jaw in the front. And so the cervical spine sort of is what it is. You're not going to get lack of development of the cervical spine typically. So really the biggest advantage and the opportunity that we have is being able to grow the maxilla and grow the mandible, the, the jaw structure, in order to have those kind of grow to our you know, human genetic potential. Because our genes tell, tell our bones to grow, but our muscles tell our bones where to grow. So you know, that's really super important is having the structures be sort of developed properly through the use of good mechanics, through the use of good function, through the use of our muscles. So, so are you, you're saying that, that our bones can grow even as adults, they can shift where they grow? Because like I'm five foot 10, I would love to be six two. <laughs> Mm -hmm. But I don't think my bones are going to grow to accommodate that. Are you saying that my, my jaw bones, my mandible and maxilla can actually change their shape based on what I do with my tongue? Yeah. And so that's probably the most, one of the more controversial things within the orthodontic literature and within the dental uh, literature that's out there. But great people like Dr. Mariana Evans, who refused to live within the book of, you know, the orthodontic program that she was taught by, they've sort of kind of pressed the limits on what is possible. Dr. Mariana Evans and these, you know, structurally um, focused, airway focused orthodontists are showing us that we have true osteogenic potential at any, at any age of life. And so there's thought that once all the sutures kind of fuse in the skull, that they're not going to move anymore. And then we have sort of appliances and myofunctional therapy and osteopathic work and osteopath um, sort of principles that show us that if we start doing things differently, if we start activating different muscles, if we start sort of operating the way that we should have, we actually can grow bone after the age of 13, 14 years, years old, where it's known to sort of stop its growth. And so, yeah, by the time 
we're six years old, 80% of our jaw, jaw growth is, is usually complete. By the time we're 12 years old, 90% of our jaw growth is complete. By the time we're 15, it's usually complete. But, you know, we're, we're kind of challenging those methodologies and showing that with, with good therapy and with good orthodontics and with good sort of functional appliances and things like that, we can actually get bone to grow in, in places that we never know could, and not just more bone, but we want to have the cranial bone sort of balance out, right? And so there's a lot of functional appliances we use to just try and manipulate the way that our structures sort of are in balance with each other to have everything sort of operate a little bit more efficiently. So yeah, I'm here to tell you, absolutely, Howard, we can grow bone after the age of what, what, what was once sort of uh, predetermined as the end age for, for growth. Mm. So before we get into how we do that, and I'll ask you to use me as an example since I sure. came up with such a, an interesting mouth, shall we say, I want to go a little bit deeper into like the costs of poor breathing. So you said it controls our central nervous system. Mm -hmm. So in, in the James Nestor book, he, he talks about um, our inability to tolerate carbon dioxide and I was reading in some other some other works that that can be related to anxiety. Like, can you can you paint that picture for us? Yeah, absolutely. So that's one of my favorite topics, and you know that's sort of the physiology and the science behind breathing, which is um, often misunderstood. I mean, we just don't. Again, we don't have any specialties that focus just on breathing. The closest thing we have to that is a, our pulmonologists, and our pul pulmonologists really operate you know, within the lower airway. And so we don't have an expert at the upper airway. And so this is the position that us dentists and in the ENTs and all can, can kind of be in. But let me go into the sort of the, the physiology of breathing and, and you named it. Carbon dioxide is really the key sort of gas that we need to be evaluating more. And we really don't have a great way to evaluate carbon dioxide. Anybody can put a pulse ox on their finger and figure out, you know, how much oxygen is in their blood. And most all of us are going to have, you know, safe levels of oxygen pretty much all day long. And if we don't, you know, that's, that's, that's a lot of trouble. That means that we're probably so sick that we might need the help of a pulmonologist or we might need to be supplemented with oxygen. But to go into the physiology of breathing, so let's talk about that real quick. So our affinity for carbon dioxide really rests in uh, a couple of things. Number one, within the blood, we have hemoglobin. And hemoglobin really has sort of two receptor sites. One is for carbon dioxide and one is for oxygen. Now, when our hemoglobin is operating efficiently, the carbon dioxide is latched to the hemoglobin, the oxygen is latched to the hemoglobin, and as that hemoglobin moves through our blood, we can actually drop off oxygen to the tissues that need it the most, okay? So when we, when we lose carbon dioxide, and the easiest way to lose carbon dioxide is heavy breathing through the mouth. So when we breathe with our chest shallowly and we breathe through our mouth, we lose we lose high, high levels of carbon dioxide right out of our mouth. That's why when people hyperventilate, they tell them to put the bag over their mouth and they breathe into a bag. That's just so we don't lose too much carbon dioxide because when we lose carbon dioxide, what those hemoglobin molecule, molecules do is they lose that carbon dioxide. It comes off of the receptor site and then the oxygen is not available to be given to the tissues that it needs, right? So what does that do? That puts the body in more of a st stress mode. It puts the body in more of a fight or flight mode. And so we find that the sympathetic nervous system, which is that fight or flight sort of um, uh, response is often upregulated in many of our patients who have anxiety, who have breathing problems, who have cardiovascular disease. And we find that the sympathetic nervous system is just out of control. And that leads to less sort of, um, uh, less sort of opportune and healthy efficiency, efficiencies of, you know, transmitting the neurotransmitters that are in the brain. And so we often find that people that have anxiety and depression, they're just sympathetically upregulated to the point where they're not in balance anymore. They can't, they can't control themselves. And that then puts them in that cycle where they want to breathe more. So the more carbon dioxide we lose, the more that we want to sort of we, the more that we want to sort of catch up and the more that we want to sort of um, compensate for that. So that puts the body off balance and that central nervous system can never truly be efficient and cannot regulate itself if we're constantly in this up and down sort of seesaw motion of whether or not our bodies are balanced. 
Is that kind of make, does that make sense? So you're, you're saying that, um, I could be, I could be have anxiety or depression and my mind is going to look in my life and tell me why. Right. It's going to say it's because of this relationship issue. It's because of COVID. It's because of the state of the world. It's because your parents and, and what are all those things? Those are all stressful things, right? Right. But, but, the, but it doesn't matter. Like the, the, the stress, the anxiety, depression you're saying could be completely physiological. And I'm just, I'm just looking for hooks to hang it on that somebody else, or if I was breathing right. properly, I could have the same childhood. I have the same relationship issues and I wouldn't, I would, I wouldn't, they're, they're, they're sort of the, the, the later hooks to hang it on. It's sort of a free floating depression, anxiety based on physiology. And, but I'm going to go to cognitive behavioral therapy, or I'm going to go get psychoanalyzed to try to figure this out when in fact the root cause, the physiological root cause, and not, not to diminish psychological pain. But I mean, this, this is pretty amazing that the physiology of, of, of not enough CO2 and CO2, like what I, the way I learned it was that about the trees, right? We're opposite CO2 and oxygen yeah. are opposites. So if I breathe in oxygen then CO2 is kind of like bad, that's what I want to get rid of. And this is like a totally different understanding. Yeah. So, I mean, I think that's a great point. So let me tell you this. So you kind of mentioned it. So how much oxygen is in, is in our atmosphere? About 20%, right? How much carbon dioxide is available in our atmosphere? Do you know that? Um, well, probably very little because it's mostly nitrogen. 0.03% carbon dioxide. So everybody looks at breathing as like an oxygen problem, but I'm here to tell you, it's pretty easy to get oxygen. It's really not that difficult to get oxygen. It's usually, if you, if you exhale and if you eliminate a lot of the carbon dioxide that you have that should be so balanced in your system it's really hard to uptake more carbon dioxide there's 0.03 percent of that in the atmosphere so it's extremely difficult to sort of make up for lost carbon dioxide and you know what regulates all this stuff howard it's the chemoreceptors in our upper airway our upper airway is this muscular tube that basically goes from the tip of our nose to the bottom of our throat where our lungs then meet the windpipe, where, right where, where our, the air that comes in actually has a chance to be distributed to the rest of our body. But the chemoreceptors that are located in our upper airway really determine whether or not our nervous system goes into sympathetic mode, fight or flight, or whether it goes into parasympathetic, rest and digest, right? So the, the worse that we breathe, the more these stressors that everybody, and everybody deals with stress, I understand that, and some probably more than others, but there are people that have very hard psychological you know, paths in this world and very hard psychological stressors that they have to deal with, who deal with it much, much better and who can still live a healthy life just because of the way that they operate, because of the way that they breathe. And so that's why, you know, whenever we're assessing someone who's off balance, why not look at the breathing? Why won't, why wouldn't that be the first thing that we look at? So what do you think that, you know, these physicians are doing to people that come in with anxiety? What do you think that these physicians are doing to people that come in with high blood pressure or people that come in with insomnia, right? What do they do? What is, what's the typical met in our current healthcare system? What typically, how are those patients treated? You know, right? With medications. Right. With, with medications to suppress the symptoms. With, pharmace with pharmaceutics and pharmaceutical um, sort of solutions, which just put short-term band-aids on these sort of problems that are deeply rooted that need to be sort of figured out why, you know? So in the eras of medicine, you know, hopefully we're coming into a new era of medicine where we continue to challenge physicians. We continue to challenge, you know, former beliefs and we say, why? And then when that question gets answered, mm -hmm. we say, why? And then when that question gets answered, we say why, and we continue to ask why until there's no more whys left to understand. And that's the cool thing about what we do is 
We just, why, 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 why? And that will lead you to the origin of the problem. That will lead you to the root cause. So instead of putting adults on Ambien, instead of putting adults on these selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, right? These anti-anxiety, anti-depression medications, instead of sending adults to a psychologist who's gonna get into their past, why would we not just evaluate their breathing right off the bat? Because it's, it's harmless. You know, you, you went through the, and I want to get into this, you went through the evaluation in my office. Did we do anything re, re, non-reversible to you? Did we do anything that was invasive to you? Did we do anything that could potentially put another stressor into your life? Or did we do more of a comprehensive exam that tried to figure out if there was something more here um, to kind of have a why for some of the issues that you came in with? Yeah, cer certainly it was a do no harm. Um, so, so I don't, I, you know, talking about whys, and I don't know if there is an answer to this or if it's just speculative, but what's the relationship between CO2 and fight or flight? Like if I'm walking along and I see a brown bear growling at me, like to me that indicates, okay, that makes sense why I would go into fight or flight. If the, you know, as, as a result of fight or flight, um, my breathing increases, my heart rate increases, the blood moves into my core muscles from extreme, like I get all that. What is the possible relationship between sort of, you know, lower level or high, you know, CO2, excess, yeah. upper airway breathing and fight or flight? Yeah, so great question. So uh, CO2, look at CO2 as literally the most important gas as our CO2 affinity determines our urge to breathe, okay? And so as you know, bre normal breathing is five and a half seconds in and five and a half seconds out, or maybe even six seconds in, six seconds out. When we have changes in our blood gases and we have changes within our upper airway that throw off that blood gas sort of balance of CO2 and oxygen, then what we do is we have either a, either a hypercapnic state or we have a hypocapnic state, right? Hyper meaning we have too much CO2, hypo meaning we, we have less CO2. So basically what we're doing when we're holding our breath and we, and we don't get oxygen and, and, you know, the James Nestor book does a great job of sort of um, calling this out and he, he quotes and he references these deep sea divers that have learned to do these amazing breath holds to the point where they can hold their breath for eight minutes and one guy could hold their, his breath for 11 minutes or something, something absolutely mm -hmm. crazy. So when we're able to control our CO2, we're able to sort of hold our breath longer. So at nighttime, what happens if we're not breathing properly is we start holding our breath. And so as that CO2 sort of builds up, the oxygen becomes lower because we're not getting it from, our, from the external environment and our CO2 starts building up, our, our affinity to breathe becomes higher and higher and higher and the urge to breathe becomes more and more. So when, we, when, we, when our CO2 builds up, we basically trigger our nervous system to basically do a compensatory type of breathing, which is through the mouth. Now, all of a sudden, the CO2 builds up. Now you're losing CO2 by mouth breathing because you're trying to take in as much oxygen as possible. Any sort of shift in these blood gases, whether high or low, will automatically trigger the sympathetic nervous system, which is that fight or flight. The sympathetic nervous system is the one that tries to um, sense danger and put yourself in, in the best position to handle it short term. So being sympathetic for a little bit is good. If you do see that bear coming, you need a sympathetic response. If you have what's called obstructive sleep apnea at nighttime and your airway collapses and you can't breathe, you do need that sympathetic response. It's healthy to have that sympathetic response because the brain needs to wake up, send the correct signals for the muscles to activate and for the urge to be able to breathe. But, you, but that sympathetic nervous system is there for the short term. You know, you, you don't want to use that sympathetic nervous system because it has these side effects like adrenaline and norepinephrine and cortisol, these, these things that, you know, we use in, in serious states of stress that really our bodies do well with in, in very low quantities, right? So it, it's that balance that I'm talking about. It's mm -hmm. that balance that, you know, the parasympathetic nervous system and the sympathetic nervous system, they need to have that communication. They need to have that balance. 
And that's what the body is about. That's what the earth is about. That's what our atmosphere is about is, is balance. And whenever there's a shift in that balance and it's off, immediately our, our fight or flight system will trigger in. So does that make sense as far as the breathing goes? When our breathing be becomes sort of compensatory and our, and, our, and our blood oxygen and our blood CO2 levels are off, we immediately mm -hmm. want to try and rebound and recover and compensate mm -hmm. and do things that are going to help us, you know, in the shortest, in the shortest, most quick acting um, sort of uh, philosophy possible to try and recover. And, and our bodies are just always back and forth which leads to these imbalances. Mm -hmm. And I guess, you know, you can, they say, you know, you can go weeks without food, days without water, minutes without air. Mm -hmm. So it, it becomes the most, the, the highest priority thing ever is if you feel like you're, you're deprived of the, the air you need in the, in the right ratios. Exactly. So, so are you, are you saying that we, because of my decades long sleep apnea, that I'm basically flooding my body with stress hormones while I sleep? Uh, I, that's exactly what I'm saying. Yes. Yeah. So, I mean, people, you, everybody needs to sort of take another, you know, breathing is at the core of all this stuff, but I think, you know, sleep is one of the pillars that we've recognized as being something that's, you know, important, but you know, the things that the body does and the brain does when you sleep is incredible. It's, it's actually something that is just now being understood you know, more so today than it ever was. And, you know, the researchers and the, and the, the, the scientists that are studying this stuff are trying to figure out if there's anything in, in, in the body and in the brain that sleep doesn't affect. So it's really super important, Howard, you can put as much sort of, you can put as much sort of uh, emphasis on being healthy throughout the day. But if the body is in a state of survival and the body's in a state of stress at nighttime, like you're, you're just never going to get the results of all the good practices that you're, you know, doing throughout the day. So, you know, we really have to look at sleep as, you know, the most important sort of seven to nine hours of our life where our brains get to clean themselves and our bodies get to recover and our systems get to sort of rejuvenate and revitalize and heal. And sleep needs to look at, be looked at as healing. So for someone with a breathing problem, you can't possibly heal. And for someone like you, who you say have had breathing problems, you know, for decades and flooding your system with these stress hormones at nighttime, you're not possibly getting the most out of your sleep that perhaps someone else is who could potentially be healthy. And I know how sort of health aware you are, and I know all of your good practices. I know your exercise routines. I know your, your nutritional routines, which are fantastic. Believe me, if all of my patients did what you did, I'd be, I'd be on top of the world. I'd live the best life in the, in the world because I would, I would have the most ideal patients. So working with people like you is extremely refreshing to me because all the other sort of pillars of health are, have been understood and you have the wherewithal and you have the, 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 the know-how to be able to, you know, practice these on a daily basis. But I often in my clinic get people that are down on their luck, they're down on their health and, and we have to start we have to start fresh and we're sort of the first sort of line of, hey, you have a breathing problem, but you have an eating problem, you have a sedentary problem, you have a mental problem. I mean, a lot of these people that walk into this center really have not had the uh, education, the knowledge to, to, to live a healthy life. Yeah, well, and, and for me, that was the frustration, right? Like, I, okay, so I look at myself, I'm eating, uh, there's, there's, yeah, sure, there's room for improvement, but not a lot. I run six days a week, I work in the yard, I have social time, I play music. I, everything was on point and I'm still fatigued. I still have fairly high blood pressure. I have high cholesterol. Like I'm just thinking, well, there's nothing else. I, I'm doing everything I can. And I wanna correct one thing you said. You said for decades I had breathing problems. They, I didn't have breathing problems. I snored at night, that was funny. <laughs> and. <laughs> Uh, I breathe through my mouth when I do anything, especially sports, sure. but they weren't problems right. until, until I, you know, got my, I discovered I had sleep apnea. I struggled with a CPAP machine, uh, which I really was not tolerant of. I would find myself, you know, having ripped it off in the middle of the night or my nose was so sore I could hardly breathe through it during the day. Um, two weeks ago, I went up 
to see you and I discovered that I had breathing problems. Can you can you talk about my <laughs> my holes and my my airways? <laughs> like what did you what did you see? What was you know what what did I present? And I guess it's not that different from what you had yourself. Um, and a lot of, I guess, the staff who work at your office have. It's pretty, pretty common. Can you talk about like yeah. what you, what you saw in my head? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so you know, the first thing we do with our patients, which I think is extremely important, is you know we want to find out why are you here. And and as you can attest to, that's the first thing we ask you, Howard. Why are you here? Because everybody comes in in different sort of phases of their life. Everybody comes in at different points of their life. And it's really important for my team and I to understand, you know, what part of this sort of journey, where, where are you at? What part of, of your journey are you in? Are you at in, in the um, phase of, I now know what my problem is and I want to get help? Or are you, you know, so sort of uneducated on what is healthy and what is not that we have to go back to um, an education model? So the first thing we do is understand where a patient, patient is when they come in you know, cause we want to meet them there. We don't want to assume that you're this, that you've read the James Nestor book. I wish everybody would read the James Nestor book before they came and see me. In fact, I think I might, I might, I might do that as a prerequisite from now on. Any patient that calls the office, I might say, read the, read the Nestor book and then I'll see you. Um, but you know, everybody comes in at a different kind of, uh, in the different sort of, um, uh, level in their life. And so the first thing we do is kind of find out that uh, subjectively. And then we do a really comprehensive physical exam. So the first thing I do, Howard, is I look inside your mouth. And so the, the things that popped out to me were, holy moly, this guy's tongue is really, really big, right? And so I don't think you have a big tongue, but in comparison to your jaw size, your tongue looks like it doesn't fit inside your mouth. So that stood out to me right off the bat. And yeah, you, and the words you used were, it's like a six foot tiger in a three foot cage. That's right. That's right. And there's a famous book that actually that's the title of it. And, and I say that all the time. I'm like, you know, your tongue is almost like a six foot tiger in a three foot cage. It doesn't look like it fits. Well, why is that? And it's not because your tongue, you don't have macroglossia. You don't have this big fat tongue. You have these really small jaws. So the first thing I'm looking at is I'm zooming out. I'm not using my loops. I'm not keying in on a cavity that's in this little tiny area of your of your tooth i'm looking at your structure and i'm looking at how big are your jaws and how big is your tongue and are your teeth in the right position and do you have all of your teeth so the thing that jumped off the page to me is when you opened your mouth howard i said where are all your teeth and you said what do you mean i had them pulled out when i was a kid i said no your permanent teeth not your not your not your your baby teeth i know those are gone where are your permanent teeth and you said no, I had to pull them out because they didn't fit. And I said, oh my gosh, that's like the biggest problem in the world. Like if your teeth don't fit in your mouth, that means your bones didn't develop correctly. That means your jaws didn't develop correctly. So I said, automatically, without even understanding how you breathe, you're automatically at a disadvantage. You're automatically at a, at a sort of um, a, a lower um, opportunity to breathe than someone else. Because as I described, the jaws are what kind of forms the airway. The jaw, jaws are kind of, determines how big the airway is. So when I looked in, in the back of your throat, I couldn't see your big breathing hole. I couldn't see, you know, that hole that allows you to breathe through. And so your structures just seem really sort of uh, small to me. The other thing I noticed was your teeth were sort of ground down and you've been doing a lot of clenching forever. And so we now know that clenching and grinding are sort of a, a big sign that someone can't breathe at nighttime. Because if you think about it, Stre the, the stress of not breathing is the biggest stress in the entire world. I don't care if your dog just died. I don't care if you just diagnosed, got diagnosed with you know, stage four cancer. If you can't breathe, that's gonna take precedent over anything. And so for someone who can't breathe at nighttime, your body has been sort of trying to compensate that for so long. And the easiest way to compensate that without actually waking you up and bringing you out of sleep is to tell your, your masseter muscles and your temporalis muscles and the muscles of your face to contract down. And when you contract these muscles, your teeth will touch each other and your jaws will be reoriented and they'll be sort of out of the way. When your tongue gets activated, the tongue will actually move forward and get out of the way so you can breathe again. So we often find that you know grinding and clenching is the easiest way to see somebody who is to see a sign that somebody has a breathing problem. So now when we look at people's teeth and they're ground down, you know, we don't say, hey, why are you, 
you know, why are you stressing out so much about your job? We say, hey, are you having trouble breathing at nighttime? Do you know that you clench during the day or does it just happen at nighttime? We want to be able to sort of understand that root cause. And then, you know, after we just look, which is something every single dentist can do. And in fact, even a physician could do this. Even a physician could shine a light inside someone's mouth and look for these things. And that's sort of my platform is being able to train people outside of dentistry how to look for this stuff. So inside the mouth, that's what we look for. And then I think we moved on to more advanced technology. We took that 3D scan that went around your whole head. And I think, you know, what I told you is I look, I know what you look like from the outside in, but now I know what you look like from the inside out. And so 3D cone beam scanning technology has allowed us to identify structural injuries mm -hmm. and to be able to measure things. As doctors and as scientists, we love, we love to measure things because if we can't put it on paper, it's not real, right? We don't like to just be, we don't like to have artwork. We like to have scientific work. Can I, so, can I, can I, inter can I interrupt yeah. with a question? Because yeah. you're talking about like the shape of the mouth. But you also said that mouth, you should not be mouth breathing. So the mouth isn't the airway. So how does the shape of the mouth affect the airway? Yeah, great question. So um, unfortunately, Howard, as you know, a lot of people do breathe through their mouth, right? So when we breathe through our mouth, we're getting all that cool, dry, dirty air. We're getting more sort of bacteria exposure. We're getting more dry mouth, which can dry out the back of the airway as well. But as the jaws are smaller, as the mouth is smaller, so is the nose. So the roof of the mouth is actually the floor of the nose. So when the roof of the mouth is small and we have mid facial deficiencies like you and like me, when our maxillas are small, we have less propensity to breathe through our nose. We have smaller nasal airways as well. So we're exposed to a lot of inflammation. We're exposed to more pollution. We're exposed to foods that cause us to have sort of swelling inside our tissues, our noses and all that. But if we had bigger noses inside, if we had more room to be able to breathe with inside, maybe some of that inflammation wouldn't be as big of a deal. But when we have these smaller noses, these smaller upper jaws, the littlest bit of inflammation, like when I drink a IPA beer or when I eat a piece of cheese pizza, my nose just explodes. The tissues inside my nose, the erectile tissue inside my nose become bigger. And so I can't breathe through my nose. And then I start breathing through my mouth. And so... Um, people don't really realize that, that the, the roof of the mouth is the floor of the nose. So if the jaws are small, the nasal structures are going to be small as well. Does gotcha, that make gotcha. sense? Yeah. So when we, when we do that 3D scan, we measure all this stuff. We can measure how big is your jaw. And I think, you know, I, you said I could say this, right? Your, your upper jaw was 30 millimeters transverse. So from side to side, from molar to molar, you were 30 millimeters. And so the minimum we should be is 40. So you're a centimeter underdeveloped. You're 10 millimeters underdeveloped in your, in your mid face, which is sort of the bone that allows the airway to grow, which is the bone that allows the nose to work properly, right? So imagine someone like, you know, Bryce Harper, who is local Philadelphia Philly. He's got this big, huge lower face. His, his upper jaw might be 50 millimeters. Yours is 30. You know what I mean? So he has way better chance of breathing than perhaps you. So by understanding the, the structures of the skull, the jaw joints, the nose, the sinuses, the teeth, the jaws, and then we were able, and I think you thought that how cool this was, we were actually able to use a um, measuring technique, a 3D measuring techniques, where we were able to tell you how big your airway was. So we measure the whole entire airway in the back of the throat. And so we often find that a lot of our patients have small airways. Non coincidentally, these people have a lot have a lot of time breathe have a hard time breathing. These people are the ones that tend to breathe through their mouth at nighttime. These people are the ones that tend to breathe um, and snore at nighttime. These people are, these are the people that tend to have a pretty severe sort of medical condition called obstructive sleep apnea, right? And that's sort of the most severe form of breathing, ob obstructive sleep apnea. And unfortunately, I feel like our medical colleagues have said if you don't have obstructive sleep apnea, you don't need help with breathing. But I'm here to tell you, I don't have obstructive sleep apnea, but I have upper airway resistance. I have smaller jaws. I have a harder time breathing through my nose. So do I not need attention? Do I have to wait until I develop 20 years from now obstructive sleep apnea because of years of improper breathing? So, you know, when are we going to start to take a stance and start to put our foot down and say, hey, we need to get people help who show signs of problems, 
who show signs of snoring, who show signs of mouth breathing? When are we going to be able to identify that as the sort of key indicator for a person who needs help? Right. Well, you know, waiting for obstructive, obstructive sleep apnea is like waiting for a heart attack to say, exactly. oh, well, there's, there's a heart problem. At least with cardiology, we have preventive statins. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so, so here's a question. Before I even came up, I had a, um, a video consult I think, with Dana, mm -hmm. right? And the first thing she said was when we started talking was, well, you clearly have trouble. You're struggling to breathe through your nose. And here was somebody looking at a three inch screen, able to tell that I have trouble breathing through my nose. When for me, this was just, this is how I breathe. Like there was no, I had no frame of reference that this was, hard right like this is just how it's been so for somebody else out there like like what did she see and how might someone else like you said part of your your mission is to teach people who are not dentists well my the people who are watching and listening to this most of them are lay people like how can we tell if we have breathing problems yeah so a, cu a couple things i think one is sort of a static kind of um indication and and secondly is sort of what you were just doing while you were speaking so while you were speaking you typically take a, a second or so in between your talking to breathe do you have you have you noticed that about your speech is you you will speak and then you'll i'm only i'm only doing that because now you're getting me to nose breathe otherwise i could talk all day and just mouth breathe breathe through your breathe through your mouth yeah so i think you know taking that second i think dana uh recognized that i think the other thing that you know, we've become as airway people that are educated in this, we observe people and we look at people, are they able to keep their lips sort of together at all times? And so I think one of the things she noticed with you is, you know, your lips are kind of drooping open uh, mm. at times to be able to get more air in. And that's something that we see, you know, whether it be adults or kids that people are just, they're walking around with their mouths open. I mean, it's, it's, it's terrible, but if we walk around with our mouths open, our tongues are resting low. Our tongues are not stimulating the roof of our mouth to grow bigger and stronger and, and more downwards and forwards. So when our mouth is open, our tongues are low. When our mouth is closed, hopefully our tongues are up. And so when she's just kind of observing you, she's looking at um, number one, are your lips together? Number two, when you smile, can you see these black triangles? And are your jaws sort of kind of narrow or are they nice and big? You know, so I think a lot of the things that she has learned over the years, and Dana has been with me since I started this career, um, she's kind of learned to observe people and learn to sort of pick out things. And so all of us, we joke in the center here because all of us are sort of educated on this. And we just walk around today and we're just like, Oh my gosh, mouth breather, mouth breather, mouth breather. We're just calling it out as we see it. And other people just think it's normal. And we're like, now that we know, we can never not know. Mm -hmm. And so you sort of take that for granted because we, before you didn't know, everything just seemed normal and la-di-da. And then when you educate yourself and your eyes are like open to all these problems, you, it's, almost, it's, it's almost like um, it's sort of a double-edged sword because you, you wanna be able to help somebody but it's so, it's hard to look past it and you don't want to offend somebody. So like I find myself at birthday parties, I find myself out in the public, like just constantly like judging people for their <laughs> breathing. And it's, it makes me feel a little bit sort of awkward at times. And I want to say something, but I don't want to say something, you know, it's not really my right to tell somebody whether or not they're breathing correctly. I didn't know if it would be offensive or not. So I think Dana, to, to, to put it clear and simple, she was just judging the hell out of you is what she was doing. Mm -hmm. it was, yeah, it was beautiful. So before, before, before we go on to solutions, let's talk about my beautiful nose, which on, on the, um, the scan looked like a mining accident. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, fortunately for us, because as I said, the, the beginning of the airway is the nose. And we have to be able to breathe through our nose to get that warm, moist, filtered, clean oxygen, right? So we, we never do an exam. We never recommend treatment without understanding the actual structure of the nose. And so, you know, inside the nose, we have what's called an internal nasal valve. A lot of people just suffer from internal nasal valve collapse where their nasal valves are just sort of more narrow than everybody else's. And by doing that Cottle's maneuver, which I taught you, where you basically take your, your fingers, you pull your cheeks apart as hard as you can, and you breathe and you say, you know, for me, it works every single time. Wow, that's a ton more air that I get in through my nose. And so if you feel that you get a ton more air just by doing the Coddles maneuver, 
then that's a, that's a nasal internal valve problem. When we get past the internal valve, we get to some really important structures. Number one being the septum, the bone that kind of divides the left side from the right side. And we find oftentimes that people that can't breathe through their nose have these very bad structural sort of issues where the septum looks like a snake. The septum looks like, like you said, like a, like a, um, you know, like a mountain that just is like the most sort of uh, uh, hardest sort of obstacle to, to get through because the septum is just going every which way. And then on the sides of our septum, we have these pieces of tissue, which are called the turbinates. And the turbinates are these pieces of cartilage that can become big and can become inflamed and can start creating even more obstructions within the nose and can start pushing the nasal septum one side or the other. And for you, you had a bunch of these problems. You had the internal nasal valve collapse, meaning you couldn't get, get air into your nose. You had this deviated septum, which means the air that's flowing through your nose can't possibly be laminar flow, nice and easy passive flow. The, the pathways that air has to take through your nose are left and right and center and up and down and all over to try and get to the the, the end of the tunnel. And so I use the analogy of like, it's, you know, like driving on interstate 95, you know, if the speed limit's 75 miles per hour and the lane is as straight as you can possibly see, you have no problem getting your car up to 85, 90 miles per hour cruising down the interstate with no sort of resistance and no sort of obstacles to get around. But if that interstate 95 starts taking these hard bends and turns and there's traffic jams over here and there's a buildup of traffic in the left lane and in front of you and you have to start swerving and making all these sort of, you know, uh, changes to your, to the speed of the way your vehicle's moving, the same thing happens with air. We get all this turbulence. We get all this sort of negative pressure, which contributes even more so to the then bottom of the airway, which is that muscular tube in the back of the throat. The more turbulence we have in our noses, the more likely our airways are to have this negative pressure and to have this airway, which is more likely to collapse and to have this airway, which is more likely to constrict instead of dilate and to have, you know, reflux disease and to have sort of heartburn and these things that are so sort of easily understood all through just knowing how the person breathes through, through their nose. Mm. Okay. So we came up with sort of a three three phase or three part treatment plan for me. I don't really, one of them is to, to you referred me to Dr. Mariana Evans for some sort of like orthodontic procedure to sort of widen the jaw to give me my 40 millimeters mm -hmm. or as close as possible. Following that, once the, the shape of the, the palate and the, and the nose is settled is to do some kind of roto-rooter nose job um, internally to, to straighten things out. But the, what I want to ask you about is I also got a whole bunch of exercises to do that some of them feel really weird. And so there's two basic types. There's like muscle exercises. And like I was told that I don't swallow properly. Like I don't use my tongue right. I use my jaws instead of my tongue. So I have like a weak tongue. Sure. And then a whole bunch of exercises that feel like it's basically little either breath holds or denial of what feels like sufficient air. Can, can you explain the purpose of those? Yeah, absolutely. So um, as you kind of understood when you came to the center, we are extremely com comprehensive. We're extremely interdisciplinary. We don't think that we can do everything here in our office. Uh, that would just be foolish. We are all about interdisciplinary care. We're all about using all the resources that we have that are available to us for everybody's sort of subspecialty. It's typically my job to be able to evaluate a patient and be sort of uh, the Bill Belichick of the treatment plan. Sometimes I just sit on the sidelines and call the plays. But if I have understood sort of the playbook and I've understood sort of the issues that are at hand, if I come up with a treatment plan, I can then divvy that out to all of our sort of specialized uh, care providers and specialized therapists. That's why we use, you know, one of your you know, mentees, Karen Smith for, for nutrition. That's why we use osteopaths. That's why we use cardiologists. That's why we use ENTs. That's why we use myofunctional therapists. And so what you're describing is, you know, with your problems that we had going on, you know, we had an orthopedic problem. We had a, a, a structural problem of your jaws. So who better to deal with that 
than the structural queen herself, Dr. Mariana Evans, who is the absolute best at expanding jaws in the whole entire world. And we have her right up the road here, which is fantastic. So one, of, one part of your treatment plan was to expand your jaws and to orthopedically develop your face. A second thing was be able to identify your nasal obstructions and be able to potentially go to an ear, nose, and throat doctor to potentially have that septum straightened, to have those turbinates sort of reduced in size, and to give you more room to breathe through your nose. And then the third thing deals with more of the muscles and more of the sort of physiology of breathing and the physiology uh, of being able to sleep well. And that is what's called myofunctional therapy. And myofunctional therapy is something that is sort of um, relatively old in the grand scheme of things, but is becoming now newly, um, again, sort of popularized in, the, in today's society, which is, you know, we're able to use therapists who are either speech language pathologists or hygienists who really deal with the muscles of the face, to deal with the muscles of the mouth, and to deal with, for you, the muscles of the airway. So Lauren, who is my myofunctional therapist here, she's a former hygienist, and she's studied on, under the great Patrick McCune for her breathing therapy. So she's also a licensed Butico breathing practitioner. She is giving you exercises to basically enhance the effects of the muscles, most, most sort of notably your tongue, and your pharyngeal muscles. So if she can control what your tongue does, she can control where your tongue sits, not just at nighttime, but at daytime, giving you a chance to breathe through your nose better. If she can strengthen up the muscles, the dilator muscles of your airway, she can actually make that muscular tube for you, which is really small, she can actually make those muscles work more efficiently. She can actually get those to dilate better. She can get you to reduce some of, of these muscular compensations that you've been doing for a really long time. And we know that if all the muscles are in balance, if we know the pharyngeal muscles are tightened up and have more and have higher tone and instead of lower tone, we know you're gonna perform better when it comes to the great test of sleep. We know that you're gonna perform better when it comes to the great test of breathing through your nose, right? So if we're trying to get you to breathe through your nose and sleep better, we need to make sure we, we account for not only the structure, but the, 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 the function within, within those structures. And that's where our myofunctional therapists come into play. And that's why they're extremely critical and extremely important in our treatment plans. I rarely come up with a treatment plan that doesn't include myofunctional therapy anymore. And that's something that I've evolved with. You know, as a, as a dentist previously who did this, I used to recommend, you know, mouth appliances that just go in and would like stabilize the mouth and the jaws at nighttime and help open up the airway a little bit. Now I incorporate breathing and myofunctional therapy into just about every single one of my treatment plans. And, I, and I'll tell you, it's the difference in nine out of, nine out of 10 patients get, getting better as opposed to five out of 10. You know, it is that additional measure that once we understand the, the physiology of breathing, we can do so much more and we can impact not only a person's breathing at nighttime, but breathing during the day and probably their overall health and their overall wellness. Mm. Yeah. So I, th I have a, uh, a tentative um, conversation with Patrick McEwen scheduled for the fall when he's Sweet. done oh. with his next book. One, one more thing I wanted to ask you about, probably, probably the scariest thing you showed me for my imaging was like, I think my left sinus is just like this pool of, bacteria like you could see it on the slide and like when i saw that i you know i, I had like a minor freak out like can you just turn me upside down and shake me You're like how do we get rid of that and you know i've had treatments for it i've had taken like antibiotics antivirals um like is it there because of the the i'm breathing poorly like it's just going to keep coming back unless we fix that yeah. So a couple, a couple things. So number one, I think uh, you asked me if you could get an antibiotic for that, right? You said, do, do I need an antibiotic for that? And I'm not a, I'm not a, I'm not a big believer in antibiotics for that type of thing for chronic problems. I'm not a big believer in medications overall. I like to get my patients off of medications, but you asked me if you needed an anti antibiotic and I didn't think that that was going to solve the problem because I asked you if you felt sick. And you said, no, I actually feel pretty good today. I actually feel very normal. This is one of my better days. Yeah. And I said, well, if this is one of your better days and we have this congregation of bacteria in this left sinus, it's probably something that's there all the time, unfortunately. And so that sort of is an indication that you haven't been able to use your nose properly 
in quite some time. So number one, I remember from your scan, your septum was so deviated to the left side, your entire left side of your nose was really sort of obstructed. And so the sinuses work with airflow. The sinuses work with nitric oxide. The sinuses work with these little cilia that are all lined in your sinuses that take the bacteria and they dump it out to your nose to be sort of um, excreted by your nose through blowing your nose and all that. So, you know, what I think one is we're not using your nose a hundred percent of the time. We're not using your nose effectively. So once we can kick up your nose, once we can correct the structures, once we can get the air moving a little bit easier through your nose, there's going to be less obstruction. There's going to be less bacterial congregation. There's going to be more availability to take bacteria and have it sort of be flowing through your system and sort of stagnant. And so the, the nose is a use it or lose it phenomenon. If you don't use your nose, you're going to lose the ability for it to work properly. And so we oftentimes find that people that have severe nasal obstruction, people that have nose problems, their sinuses are just filled with this junky bacteria that just sits around and just kind of pulls like, like, like mold at the bottom of like a pool that isn't properly maintained. Right. And so we have to have our, our filter in our pool working around, like in my pool at home with the cleaner goes around all day long, the little octopus, as my kids call it at the bottom of the pool, and it keeps things moving and the systems and the pumps are all moving. Everything's working. And so with good sort of movement of water and good sort of movement of air kind of dynamics, we don't get this pulling of bacteria that sits around and becomes a chronic problem. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I was lucky. I'm only a seven hour drive away from you. And I was able, you know, I was able to take the day off and stay at a hotel and, um, and I'll probably be coming back to work with uh, Dr. Evans. What do people like, first of all, do you see, I mean, does that common for people to come from far away? Are there other, like, I, as don't take this the wrong way, but if there was anyone in my area who did what you do, I wouldn't have come to see you. Like it just, Right. But this is like what you're doing. It seems to be such a, a new and, you know, unicorn practice. Like what do people do? How do they if they suspect, oh, maybe I've been a mouth breather. Maybe I have sleep apnea. Maybe I snore. Maybe I grind my teeth. Maybe it's hard for me to breathe when I run. What do you recommend people do? Yeah. So I would obviously recommend everybody to do their homework and vet their providers. I mean, you wouldn't show up to a general surgeon and have him do your cosmetic work. You wouldn't show up to a cancer doctor who, who deals with bowel resections and have him do your nasal surgery. So if you're if you want someone who's going to understand the airway, if you want someone who's going to understand breathing, then do your homework. Vet that provider. That person's website should be thoroughly describe in all the education and training that they've been through to understand these things. And unfortunately, we're just at a time right now where just being a dentist doesn't give you the right to understand the airway. Just being a physician doesn't give you the right to understand breathing. So a lot of this stuff, unfortunately, has to take place um, through a, a person's own goodwill and, and through their own sort of passion to understand this stuff. Because like I said, all of my education came after dental school and not mm -hmm. before it. So um, I would say you have to look for someone who's airway centric. You have to look for someone who has advanced training. Obviously, there's a lot of different sort of um, credentialing boards out there. So, you know, if someone were to pop up on my, my website, it would say, hey, Dr. Robinson is a member of this, 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 and this. Dr. Robinson is board certified with the American Academy of Dental Sleep Medicine, the American Academy of Craniofacial Dental Sleep Medicine, the American Academy of Craniofacial Pain, the American Academy of Oral Facial Pain, the American Academy of Physiologic uh, Medicine and Breathing. I mean, there's a lot of different sort of um, private um, certification groups out there that have that give this education. And I'm one of those people. You know, I had the ability to go to Toronto last year and speak to a group of like 500 dentists who were there learning on craniofacial pain. And I, and, I, and I spoke to them about breathing. And so the more of us that get out to talk about this, the more people like yourself who have this platform, the more people like James Nestor, who's an, who's an author, 
I mean, I don't mean to discredit him, but he's an author and a journalist. He's not a doctor, but mm -hmm. you know what he did? He immersed himself in the research. He did, he probably is educated more on breathing than most any physician that I've ever met. So like he's sort of an expert in breathing and we need to start putting breathing as its own sort of subspecialty. And so when someone is looking for someone like me, I mean, number one, you can call me and ask me if there's anybody in your area. Unfortunately, you live in North Carolina. I didn't really know anybody in your area who does what I do. So I said, you know, hey, unfortunately I don't. But people like me are kind of pocketed around the country and around the world. So I, I thank you for kind of acknowledging the fact that we're a unicorn practice, but this is something that we've dedicated our lives to. This is something that, you know, I, I, I kind of have, I've retired from the world of clinical dentistry. I don't, I'm not a tooth mechanic anymore. Mm -hmm. I don't drill on people's teeth anymore. I've dedicated myself to helping people breathe better in order to improve their health. So there's other providers like that who are out there like me. They're just sort of hard to find right now because, you know, the education is just not sort of um, available as commercially as, as it should be. All right. So I've got two, two more questions for you. One is you mentioned that you were very excited about pediatric work. Can you talk about, about that? And I know you have a conference that's been postponed that uh, I hope to attend in the spring. What's, what's the interest in, in the pediatric and working with children and breathing? Yeah. So I'm so glad you brought that up because I, I, honestly, I really have been treating adults my entire life on, Honestly, I didn't really like kids too much when I was a dentist. I hated working with them. I didn't like the behavior <laughs> part of it. Uh, and then I had my own kids and I had my son with extended stays uh, at the local hospital because of asthma and because of respiratory problems. I had my daughter who was uh, shortly thereafter who had extended stays at the local children's hospital here. And I really started understanding, hey, as many adults as I'm treating, as many adults as I'm managing, as many adults as I'm helping, you know what I, well, you know what's even more powerful that? To intercept a kid as they're developing because kids are, you can mold them. You can prevent you. You can prevent me. We can prevent small jaws. If we get in, in, in involved in a kid's life at the earliest sign of a problem, which could be snoring, which could be grinding to the teeth, which could be asthma, which could be um, hyperactivity, which could be um, crooked teeth. Any sort of, of these little signs that you can identify in a kid with could be lack of attention in the classroom, right? Any of these little signs that you can see, you get them involved with like a Lauren of my practice or me and I do a, an airway evaluation, I can probably prevent that kid from having small jaws like you and me. I can probably prevent that kid from having to deal with a lifetime of health you know, consequences and issues. So if we get to the kids early, everything is preventable. We can, I'm, I can now be, instead of, a, instead of a helper, I can be a curer. Like what better thing to do than to help cure somebody than to help sort of prevent someone from dealing with the same sorts of things that I'm dealing with. So both of my kids from an early age have been in therapy. Like, you know, both of my kids have alpha appliances and alpha appliances are these little light wire functional appliances that go, you know, inside their mouth that allow good tongue position, that allow them to work with an osteopath to get, you know, craniosacral balance, that allow them to work with Lauren, my myofunctional therapist, to get the tongue up on the roof of the mouth, to teach them how to breathe through their nose, to teach them how to sleep better. And so if we can start these good habits at an early age, Howard, guess what? I'm going to put myself out of business. And that's the goal for me is in Delaware here and in the Philadelphia, Baltimore, Washington sort of tri-state area. My goal is to put myself out of business. My goal is to not have to treat an adult with chronic health problems. My goal is to get involved in the kids at a young age. So you know, we're, we're starting to take an active role into educating pediatricians. We're starting to take an active role to educate teachers, you know, at local schools, you know, anybody who works with kids, notice these things, you know, these things that the kids are almost like the canaries in the coal mine. Like, you know, these kids are going through the world right now with all these major problems, you know, peanut allergies, breathing problems, inhalers, stimulants, you know, medications, you know, you name it we're making excuses for our kids and our kids are just, they're, they're, they're getting more unhealthy as the, as the sort of decades go by. And so my biggest contribution, I hope at the end of my career will be 
not just the things I was able to do for my adult patients, but the pediatric program that I created here and the pediatric program that I'm sharing around the country. We now have pediatric airway questionnaires. We have a screening form that literally anybody can use. A pediatrician can use it. A dentist can use it, right? A, a therapist can use it. Anyone who sees kids can use a pediatric airway questionnaire. Now, I've gone around and kind of passed these out. And typically locally, you know, a lot of my pediatrician colleagues are like, yeah, 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 that's too much to do. We're, we, we don't have time for that. But if I continue to knock on the door and I continue to pound on that door, eventually I know I'm gonna get more and more providers who are looking at the same thing that I'm looking at. And instead of waiting for a disease, instead of waiting for a sickness, I'm gonna be responsible for educating providers who say, you know what? I'm gonna intercept that kid's life before it becomes a problem. I'm going to notice the very, very start of a problem. And a lot of times, Howard, that's just as simple as a mouth breathing child. Mm. So, so, so real quick, the, the, um, the airway symposium that you sort of mentioned on was uh, from my great mentor, Dr. Daniel Clower, who's mentored me here in my airway way journey. He started this four years ago and basically it has moved around to different parts of the country. And so last year was in San Jose, California. And um, I could talk forever about that, but um, Dr. Clower asked me ho to, ho to host this year's in Philadelphia. And so the um, symposium is one that gets sort of um, worldwide attention. We have doctors that fly in from all around the country to learn from a panelist and from great educators, you know, to the likes of Sarush Zaghi, to Patrick McCune, to Stephen Olmos, to Kevin Boyd, to Darius Lagmani, to Daniel Clower, to Mariana Evans, you know, to Eric Phelps, all these great, great sort of educators in health and educators in pediatric airway problems. And so they come and they learn and they sit there for two days and they learn and they hopefully can take the things that they've learned back to their clinics. And hopefully by me being able to bring it to Philadelphia, I can drag by, by, you know, by my physicians and my colleagues ears around here, I can drag them to the conference and I can maybe pay for them to go and just say, hey, do me a favor, come and sit and learn and listen. And mm -hmm. if I can do that, then I've helped so many more people in my area be, to be able to get sort of the help that they need. Yeah, well, I'll include a link to the conference in the show notes cool. for today's episode, which I believe is 422. Um, so well, my last question is, so for me as a coach working with people on their health, so I'm pretty good on food. I, can, I know what to ask about sleep. I can evaluate sort of affect around stress and polyvagal vagal tone and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, a, a kindergartner, when it comes to helping people with breathing, when you mentioned that um, the, this questionnaire, the checklist, is like for someone like me who just like, how, how would I know to point someone in the direction of Buteco or a, uh, a functional, you know, a sleep dentist? Is there a, a, like a lay person's training? Is like, what would you, what would you recommend for, for people in the, you know, lifestyle medicine field who are not going to be board certified like you are? Sure. I, I mean, I think it's as easy as utilizing um, questionnaires. I think it's, it's as e easy as an intake form. I think it's as easy as asking questions like, does your child suffer from behavior problems, sleep problems, um, crooked teeth, um, allergies, sinus infections, ear infections? If any of these are a yes, if any of those mm -hmm. circles are a yes, mm -hmm. then probably you would be able to say, hey, I would recommend you go find an airway centric dentist or an airway centric ear, nose and throat doctor who can do an assessment on the airway and figure out if breathing is a problem here. Gotcha, and what about for adults? If I'm working with an adult and, and I'm, I'm suspecting that not only do they need to improve their nutrition, they need to exercise more, they need to do stress management, but they need to improve their, their breathing. So similar, do you have similar sort of intakes and questionnaires for yeah, adults? Question yeah, questionnaires, and I'd be happy to share these with anybody. Um, I'm very, very sort of, um, um, I'm very sort of open to sharing all the things that I've created in my practice as a way to kind of identify and screen for it. Again, identification, screening processes. It would just be so nice if people like you and PCPs out there, people that have the ability to touch someone's life from a health perspective, if you guys could just say, hey, 
I, I, a lot of these questions that you're answering sort of can correlate to a breathing problem. I think you need to have an airway evaluation. And that's what we say here. Have you had an airway evaluation? And an mm. airway evaluation really needs to be in the form of, you know, a cone beam scan and, um, you know, sort of a, a, an examination of the nose, an examination of the mouth, an examination of how big the jaws are growing. Right. And that's something that, you know, I'm so uniquely positioned to be able to do well, but there's other people out, out there like me who have availability to be able to do this and do it really well and then get that person the help that they need. And, you know, it takes a village to get somebody well, and it takes a village to get somebody healthy. And so when all of us sort of reach across, you know, the line and, and sort of can collaborate together and we can all sort of use these intake process processes and these forms and all to then kind of communicate our patients are much better off we just we can do so much together we can do so little when it's just us in our little specialty boxes mm -hmm. so how do people find you yeah so i mean i'm, I'm very available on the website um pain and sleep center.com it's www.pain and sleep um i have a, a great website which talks a lot about what we do. Um, I have a YouTube channel, Pain and Sleep Therapy Center of Delaware Valley. Um, on YouTube, we have um, a podcast uh, channel, which we just started getting up on iTunes. Um, I've done a lot of sort of recorded sort of continuing education. So um, I'm available. Type my name in. Go look, go look me up. I, uh, I, I've made so it. Can we, can, we, to, to can, we, can we get to the podcast and the YouTube channel from your website? Yes. Okay, so I'll, I'll put that omnibus link, painandsleepcenter.com, in the show notes. People can burn it into their minds now if they're out driving or running. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. And yeah, I mean, my, my hope is that this becomes another pillar of lifestyle. And, I, and my guess is even if, um, my, my hope is that even if people aren't able to do the full airways like the jaw thing that i'm going to do or the, that there's still exercises that people can do to begin to nose breathe instead of mouth breathe that may begin that may make a huge difference even in the, in the absence of sort of advanced medical intervention yeah i i think there is and i think one of the great sort of resources that we have available to us now is sort of better technology so we can track our sleep on on our phones we can track track our sleep using the new aura ring which goes around our you know our finger to kind of track our sleep we can download an app on our phones called snore lab which is a really simple way to figure out if you're breathing too heavy at nighttime i mean there's a lot of things that we can do that are very cheap that are very easy that can just sort of identify if there's a problem or not and try and figure out, you know, if, if, if you are a patient who needs help and if you do kind of come back and your sleep isn't perfect and, you know, you have sort of um, disease and illness that is kind of uh, uh, developing and you have um, uh, these, these applications and these uh, sort of technologies that can tell us that something's not normal, then that's an even better reason to just go get educated and go see somebody who can help. All right. Well, Dr. Ryan Robinson, this has been fascinating. It's, you know, my journey has been really, really interesting so far. Um, it's not the easiest thing in the world to fix. Like it's, you know, it takes time. I'm doing these exercises. They're taking a fair amount of time every day. And, um, you know, it's, it's part of the whole lifestyle. Like it's on me. Right. Like once I once I recognize that there's a problem and there's something that I can do about it, not only, you know, yeah, the, the downside is I have to spend time and money and energy doing it. The upside is I get to take back control over my life. And I can't think of anything like the times in my life where I have been choked. Mm -hmm. um, there's, you know, as you said, there's like nothing that matters more and there's nothing that makes me feel more helpless than being unable to breathe. Sure. And, and to realize that that's been a sort of chronic low grade state for my entire life, you know, it's humbling, it's sad, and it also gives me tremendous hope for, uh, for where I can go in the future. So I want to just, you know, thank you personally for the guidance and for your education and outreach and the mission, um, <clears throat> you know, of, of, of spreading the word about this incredibly important um, pillar of lifestyle. And I really want to thank you for your, your generous time today. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. It was absolutely my pleasure. We're looking forward to working with you and your journey and anybody else out there who wants to um, 
sort of take the, uh, the path of wellness and the root cause sort of path. And so um, thank you so much for having me. It's a, I love talking about this stuff. So anytime you want to, you want to wrap on this, just give me a call and we can chat. Awesome. Thank you so much. All right, Howard, take care. You too.